Welcome to this session from Burke Beckett Inspires. It's our free online events and activity series with resources to inspire learning, provoke thought, and entertain and excite curious minds. I'm Jo Yarker, and I'm here with Rachel Lewis to talk about work and wellbeing. Hello, as, as Jo said, I'm Rachel Lewis. Jo and I have got dual academic and practitioner careers. We joined the Department of Organisational Psychology here at Birkbeck last year. Um, in order to establish the professional doctorate in organisational psychology, which we've which we've now done and been running for a year, we we sh job share in our role at Birkbeck. So I think now the the only second job share in the University of London, and in the other half of our lives, we run a consultancy called Affinity Health at Work. Our work, both in research and practice, is focused on improving health and well-being at work. And through our doctorate programme, we're really introduced to such a broad range of ideas and theories and topics across organisational psychology. But really key to, to us is the, the importance of doing need-led research and very much so what we're known as, as doing by both clients and, and in academia is by translating our research into practical resources and interventions and by very much promoting this idea of evidence-based practice. And this is really what we wanted to share with you today. So back um, a couple of months ago, we, we worked with other um, members of the Department of Organisational Psychology to produce a guide on managing well-being in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. There will be, so what you can see on the slide here is, it, is the front page of this guide um, and some, some inserts from this. So in this guide, we had information about mental health, um, what you can do, how you spot it, what you can ask of others, and there's lots and lots of evidence-based checklists um, and resources to support you through this. So um, checklists that, that might be based on the management standards approach um, to, to looking at, at risk assessing for stress and thinking about particular psychosocial hazards that you might be that you might be faced with. To looking at the ways to well-being, the, the five areas that we need to think about with our mental health. We get, on the end of this presentation, there'll be a link to this guide. Um, you can all download it from, from Birkbeck. But today what we're going to do um, is talk about one of the resources in the, in the workbook, and that's the Igloo framework. I'm going to hand over to Joe to tell you more about that. So the Igloo framework is something that we've been working on in conjunction with um, Professor Karina Nielsen at Sheffield University. And what we tend to find when we're looking at workplace well-being and how people look after themselves or are taught to look after themselves in terms of their mental health particularly, is it's very much focused on the individual. What is it that you need to do to support yourself? Maybe go to counselling, maybe um, complete some CBT, maybe do some healthy behaviours. But actually, to, to help ourselves keep well and sustain our well-being, we need lots of things in our lives to go in the right direction. We need lots of different supports. And so what we wanted to do was to try and understand what those different resources were that really help us to sustain our well-being. And we were really fortunate to have some funding from the ESRC Productivity Insights Network to look at what is it that helps people when they return to work to sustain work in the long term. So if you've been off with mental health and you come back to work, what is it that really helps you? And we can use those really important learnings to understand what it is that all of us need to protect and, and maintain our, our well-being as we're navigating difficult times and, and feeling under pressure feeling under well. And so the IGLU approach really aims to look at what is it that we need to do as individuals, but what do we need from our group, our colleagues and our friends and family? What do we need from our leaders or our links from services? What is it that we need from organisations? And what is it that we need from, from outside the workplace to really help us maintain our well-being? And we can think of this as a protective shield that we can use to safeguard our well-being so we can sit safely inside our igloo as long as all of these different components and different levels are in place. 
And so the psychology behind the igloo draws from this idea that as humans, we're motivated to protect our resources and acquire our resources and build these. And this draws from conservation of resources theory by Hofbull. And here we have um, the idea that we need food, we need shelter, we need physiological and psychological resources. And we also need time, money, energy. We can think of these resources as quite broad but specifically in relation to managing our mental health and the workplace, it's much more important for us to think about what resources we need from both home and work at the different levels that are more than I just need support. Often when we hear people that are struggling with their mental health, they say, I just, I just need some help. I can't see what it is that I need. And this framework really aims to, to make it specific so we can see how we can navigate that journey. So at the individual level, what we found was um, creating structure to a working day is really important. And it sounds quite simple, but so few of us actually do it. We have our to-do list, we get on with the work, we maybe firefight emails. But making sure that we create structure, we prioritise importance and urgent issues. We think about prioritising self-care as well. I know that certainly when I'm busy and work starts to feel overwhelming, I put off the run, I put off doing some yoga, I don't look after myself, I bite my nails. Um, but prioritising self-care is something that people who sustain work do really, really well. And they set very clear boundaries between their home and their work. And I know that's very difficult to do, particularly when we were working at home and, and Rachel's been doing lots of work around navigating that um, remote working um, situation. And it's it can be hard, so we need to put things in, in place to make sure that we can switch off, even if we're only going next door to the next room. At the group level, sorry, at the group level, we need to um, look at how we get help, how we access help. And so here, what we're doing is we're thinking about, as an individual, we can ask our team, ask members of our team, our peers for feedback. What is it that I'm doing well? Where can I de deliver better? Give me specific feedback that can give me confidence in my performance, but also improve my performance. And also as, um, as individuals, we can ask for help when we're doing challenging work. Sometimes what we see is when people start to spiral in their mental health, they hang on to work quite preciously and don't, don't ask for help and reach out. So reaching out is a really good action we can take to help protect our mental health. And similarly, if we see others that are, are needing support, we can offer to do help on specific tasks to help them navigate that. And then outside the work, we've heard lots in the press around maintaining social connections. We might be social distancing, but actually we're physically distancing, not social distancing. And that is really important. Our social network outside of work, um, our friends, our family, reaching out and having conversations um, is so important and has been consistently found to protect mental health and sometimes we don't feel like it but we often feel much better having had a chat on the phone or reached out to a friend and then at the leader level one of the things that is really important as a manager is to make sure that um, you give control over the way work is done so we all navigate our, our days differently, particularly when we're um, working in very unusual circumstances at the moment. But having flexibility over the way that our work is done and having autonomy is a really significant predictor to mental health and a range of different outcomes at work. And so for a manager, it's important that you give control over the way that work is done, but also provide practical and emotional support. And then outside of work, we also need to have contacts and links with people who are in leadership roles. So we need to be able to contact our GP. We need to be able to access people who are able to provide us with the, the support and, and um, facilities that we need. For example, seeing a counsellor or a coach to help us provide structure um, for, for our own well-being. 
And then make sure I shall hand over to you to do the organisational level. Yeah. So at the organisational level, what we need to think about is what the organisation can provide us with in order to, to do this, this work to protect our wellbeing. So, so the idea is it's not just about us, it's not just about our peers, it's not just about our leaders, but it's also about how the organisational culture supports you. And two ideas here are about providing, for instance, flexible working practices and leave policies. So being very clear and consistent on, on what those might be in order to support us. We recognise at the moment that many of us are working in a much more flexible way than perhaps we did pre-pandemic and so having very clear guidelines about how we agree those and set the expectations is important. It's also about having a culture where mental health and physical health are prioritised. So many organisations are now talking about this idea of, of mental health becoming a strategic priority rather than a nice to have. But to think about what, what that would look like, what a, what a culture where mental health and physical health are prioritised would look like what that would appear to, to staff. So it might be things such as having a no blame culture um, or a, a culture that is, is supportive of employee voice. It might be a culture whereby there is a whole suite of, of activities and, and support for our mental and physical health. And it's also thinking about what access there is at the organisational level to, to our, our support for our wellbeing. So again, that might be that might be what kind of health and wellbeing advice we can find. Um, but also there might be charities that are, that are important and specific to your particular needs. So that might be MIND or, it's, or it could be very specific ones such as around men's mental health or about um, dealing with, with chronic ill health or for instance a condition um, or a situation such as the menopause. The, the lovely thing about the igloo is what we've done here is, is suggested to you some things that could go in the igloo at each of these levels. But these are um, no means prescriptive. And one of the things that we urge you to do, and there's resources within our wellbeing pack to do, is to think about what, what the igloo is for you. So what works for you at, at the individual level? What do you need from your team? What do you need from your leader? What, what would be important for you, for your organisation, to support your, your health and well-being? And so, so to really think, think at that structured level about, as Joe said, building this protective field, but very much the structured level that is right for you. And so, I, so what we've done is we have summarised some of the resources. So you can read the academic papers on which the base um, framework is based. And also you can have a look at some of the specific guides around this. And we produce guides that are for employees, for colleagues, for line managers and for HR professionals to have a work around using this Digloo model. And then um, and also look in our wider wellbeing guide that we mentioned at the beginning. The guide has lots of different ways to look at wellbeing and lots of different ways to approach how you would help yourself at the moment and how you would also support others. So that, that is all from us at the moment. Oh, thank you, William. So William's just put an access to the guide in, in the chat for you, so you can have a look at that. Now it's over to you. Are there any questions? So what we'd ask you to do is, is to put your chat questions in the, um, in the chat box, and then Joe and I will, will answer them over the next 15 minutes that we've got left. Yes. So the recording of the, the webinar is going to be um, is going to be on the Birkbeck Inspires site. Um, so that will be that will be shared. I, I would have thought within the next few days. So a really interesting comment from question from Sam here. So I'm struggling to cope, but I don't know how to tell my manager. Any tips? Joe, do you want to speak to this one? So. I think with this, it's always really important to remember um, 
that you were recruited into the role. It's likely that you've been doing a good job up until at least recently, or you may well be doing a good job, you just can't see that now. So I think whenever we're thinking about how do I how do I tell my manager, how do I approach this, we need to step back a little bit and be reminded or remind ourselves that um, we were recruited into the role to, to do a job. So we have, you know, we have that confidence from our, our employer. So if something has gone differently in that meantime, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to ask for support. So is it something that has changed in your home situation or outside work? Or has something gone on inside work that perhaps has unsettled you or, or put you in your stride? And I think that that's really important to um, think through carefully so that you can be really specific. Often when we're asking for help, we're not specific and we also don't provide solutions. Um, and busy managers, they don't necessarily want moans. What they do want is they want to understand what is going on for you and what you need to, to help and, and what they can do to help. So if you can think through those things, that can be really helpful. And then the other thing to do is to practice. And a number of us, I don't like role plays. I know that many of us find it really difficult. But we can often think things, but when we're having difficult conversations, to actually articulate it, we need to try it a few times to work out what words really make sense and what words land and, and feel comfortable saying it. So we really recommend that you practice a couple of times with a, a willing person around the house or on the phone, just so you can see what it feels like to, to share what you need. And that will help you get the message in the right way that feels comfortable to you. I don't know if there's anything else there that you would recommend. No, I hope that was that was useful. I think that it is it is one of those things that it is it is a very hard thing to to do. And as Joe says, having that having that ability to to practice and to and to make use potentially use templates, potentially write it down, um, and record how you're feeling is is really important. Mm. We've got a question from Nicola here about how do you manage a team that might be struggling with their mental health? They won't communicate and keep saying that they're okay. Yes, um, I think I think many of us have have experienced this. I think firstly, firstly, what we have to go back to is that is that what the research shows when we're managing remote teams is that is that it's much more important than in normal to have a, an individual approach. So what that means, firstly, is to is to not ask the team as a whole if they're okay, but go to particular people. Um, that's for a number of reasons, but the, the fact is at the moment, everyone's battling such a wide range of different different issues that they might not want to share those for, for, for any reason. It could be that they don't want to share so that they don't want other people knowing, or they feel know that other people in the team are going through stereotypically a, a they might perceive to be a worse situation from them and so they feel awkward. So the first thing is, is try and build individual individual relationships and take an individual approach to this. The second thing I would say is to is to, to go back to, to the research that tells us the best way to manage for preventing stress in employees. And and there are there are four things we need to remember here. So the first I've already mentioned, which is about this individual approach. The second thing is to is to think about making sure that you manage in a way that is is much more clear and much more concise and consistent than you might be in, in so-called real life or when you're face to face. One of the issues with um, with relying on video um, and telecommunications is that is that we're more likely to miscommunicate and so miss central things about what what people are saying. And so therefore, it's more important for you to be very consistent um, about what you're saying. Perhaps repeat objectives, be very clear on objectives, not be worried about goal setting. In fact, goal setting is really important at the moment. But set goals that you know are realistic and achievable for for people. So. So first is this individual approach. Second is make sure you're very clear and specific about what you're asking. Um, the, the third is to try and empower um, and trust as much as you can. So 
one of the things that is that is quite hard to do is that when we're managing remotely we have to let go a lot we can't see people um we don't know we don't know what's what's going on and so therefore sometimes the urge is for the manage ourselves that we try and we try and grab back some of that so we we keep checking in and, and perhaps check in more than we would do and so perhaps it's recognizing in yourself when you're when you're doing that for for them and when you're doing that to to essentially need to 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 manage the team and manage your your own um, anxiety about that so think about empowering them think about how you can get them to to trust to trust you and trust the team the more that you do that as well the more that what will happen is that they will actually build build a trusting relationship as as a team group as a peer group and therefore if there are any issues to be able to pick them up um, to pick them up within the team and therefore it might be that they might not talk to you but they will trust to talk to their peers and then somebody in the team will talk to you so it's about uh, essentially empowering and building that trust and the fourth thing is is to is to is to take action around due care for physical and psychological safety so but for physical safety we know that when we're at work and when we're in the office there might be risk assessments for for us ergonomically and whatever when we're working from home and during this situation they've been less likely to happen so i would say to 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 think about some kind of risk assessment approach to check in with people and there's um and Joe's ideas about having this structured discussion could be really useful here as well. And captured in, in terms of a consistent process you're going through to, to risk assess and check in with everyone, check in what they need. And also think about this due care being about signposting. So your role being to make sure that you're signposting and, and letting people know what resources there are at Birkbeck in order that, that they can access those and, and help themselves very long answer but I hope that's I hope that's helpful Nicola so we've got a question um, how do we encourage managers and leaders to take mental health issues seriously and um, when perhaps it's been put on one side before it's really difficult isn't it if you have somebody that's quite resistant I think what we often find when we're talking to leaders is um, to start with there is this this resistance and also a bravado that everything's fine we just need to keep going so I think often it is very helpful to have a protected group that is managers or leaders um, together where they can start to learn and share their experiences in this in a safe place because what you often find is if you ask a question about how are you feeling um, they will they will say fine if you say oh i'd be really interested to, to hear some of the things that people are finding challenging at the moment then some of the issues start to unravel and the conversation opens up a little bit i think in terms of um trying to prioritize those those arguments if people don't um believe that anxiety stress is is an issue that should be a workplace issue some will um, connect with a business argument. There's a very strong business case for looking after mental health and well-being at work that leads to productivity, that leads to good work. Sometimes we don't really always have to talk about mental health either. Sometimes you can just talk about doing the job and what it is that you need to do the job well and what are the conditions that need to be in that workplace to do the job well. And those things that help mental health help people do the job in a good way so thinking about how we manage demands how we communicate how we support each other um, in an emotional and also a practical way so there are some of the things that that can help are there any other ideas rachel that that you've come across no i think that's i think that's really useful i think one of the things that struck me is that is there's another question from adriana which really links into this and adriana was saying that She's talked to her manager about her anxiety treatment, but it seems they sometimes don't believe her. Um, she's always doing a good job. Externally, she seems fine, and so, but she's feeling the opposite inside. Um, and so that, that struggle of what, what you do when, when your manager is not supporting you. Um, I see, and I think there, the, there's a, 
a model called the mental health continuum and that looks at the idea that actually some of us can struggle with mental health and not manage it whereas others could have poor mental health or be be managing it but um, but be in a condition where they they're maintaining it in a in a healthy way and i think that that's a really important thing to to share with managers is that we can have ongoing chronic illnesses and, and mental health can be a chronic illness that, that goes on and on and maybe goes in in waves um, but we develop strategies around that but what is important is that you are allowed the opportunity for those days where it is very difficult to be able to step back often what people find is that they, they don't feel so great and then don't take action to restore and that can lead to a, a spiral which can be very difficult to then recover from so it is important to, even if you are doing a good job, to make sure that you're prioritising your ongoing um, health. And I think that links really well into this um, next question, which is around um, supporting our, our mental and physical well-being. And so some of the things that we can do to support our physical well-being also help our mental well-being. It's really, yeah. really intertwined. Um, and there are some great things you can do as a team to to promote um, physical well-being. So we've evaluated um, Fitbit challenges or step challenges. They can be quite good if, if you have a team that enjoy a little bit of competition. Finding a buddy to, to get support from so that, that you can move around during the day. Well, uh, walking meetings, I had one today where instead of Zoom, um, we actually all just got on the phone and I put my earpods in and, and went for a walk in the park, which was really great. I don't know, are there any other ideas? I think, I think they can also be be more simple looking at um, looking at things like taking breaks. And so ideas of one of the things that often happens when we're working from home is that we become more sedentary. And so this idea of promoting the importance of taking breaks, and if you are a manager, role modeling that and, and talking about the importance of every hour we should be taking a break and that might be getting up. It can also just be as simple as educating. So I know that we'd, we've worked with Femida Muneer, Muneer who does lots of work around around the sit stand approach and how important it is to stand sometimes um, and and how standing just for just for an extra 60 minutes a day can can have a massive impact on our physical and mental health and in, in fact extend our life term and and so sometimes seeing that seeing that literature can be important and i know joe's joe's talked to me about how she's put her laptop inside almost shelving units so that you can stand sometimes i told my husband who's normally doesn't listen to anything i say and he and he's bought one of these desks where where you can actually physically move it yourself, and now he stands most of the time. This is great. I've seen lots of people using ironing boards as well yeah. as improvised yeah. stand desks. I think also promoting physical well-being is also think recognizing that when we are working from home, we're more likely to to neglect the health promoting behaviours that we have. Mm -hmm. So Joe talking very much about this link between between um, mental and physical health. And so when we're when we work from home, we're less likely to exercise. We're more likely to eat unhealthy food um, because probably the kitchen's the kitchen's closer to us in the snack drawer. Um, um, and we're more likely to drink more alcohol and we're more likely to sleep badly. And I think sleep promoting the importance of sleep is really important as well. And so thinking about those sleep hygiene methods and why the way you can do that as managers is through boundary management is through promoting promoting a culture to your team whereby you do stop work at a particular time and therefore you do you do have that time to wind down and switch off and therefore give yourself the opportunity to to sleep that looks we really that. well let's go on to another question I was say, it works really well so um the question around keeping motivated while working at home yeah. and i think so many people are finding that a challenge now. Certainly lots of the press is picking up on this idea that whilst home working works for some people, um, it's really jolly hard to keep yourself motivated without all the normal cues and without all the, the sense of urgency that you sometimes get. Um, I know certainly when I know I've got to leave at four to five to go somewhere and, and, and 
pick up the children or do a job um you got that sense of i need to get this finished and off i go whereas when we're at home and we can maybe work till six or we could have dinner and maybe work until 10 we lose that momentum and, and that sharpness sometimes and so there are a whole range of things that we can do and really part of it is thinking about what is it that you think is is causing that and where is the lack of structure coming so making sure you get dressed in the morning is really important and looking like you would do when you go to work i know certainly i got into a stage where i was just wearing my slippers every day and thought no i need to i need to pick myself up now i need to get dressed as if i'm going to work maybe walking around um the block so you're doing a commute even if it's just back to the same same place that you had your breakfast and um, taking small steps to put that routine into your day and then from a, a motivational point of view we know from goal setting it's really important to have um, specific goals it's really important to make sure that they are small as well particularly people with mental ill health challenges a big goal can be completely overwhelming and really demotivating so breaking down so that um, you have very, very discrete sub goals to a task can be good and thinking about how you might reward yourself in different ways. Um, so I'll do three little bits of this and then I'll go um, and just have a cup of coffee in the garden or I'll do this and then I'll have five minutes watching TV. I don't know, Rachel, if you've got some. Yeah, I think really important if you're managers as well to think about how you are going to give feedback on, on goals. And, and therefore give feedback on accomplishments as well. So there's often that risk of out of sight, out of mind. We don't, we don't continually reward, um, reward and recognize when people are doing a good job. And at the moment, doing a good job is probably and lower in our expectations than doing a good job was six months ago. So it's about continually motivating. One thing I'd add to all of this is that, is that one, of the, one of the other things we have to do is to be kind to ourselves, be kind to others, recognize that we have we have all gone through a, a huge challenge and continue to. And so to, to consistently beat ourselves up about not being motivated is not going to be helpful. So, so recognize that this is probably a temporary situation. Yes, we can put lots of things in place in terms of in terms of setting goals, in terms of looking after ourselves better, so taking taking annual leave if you need it, having some respite, thinking about our self-care, but also recognising that, that it is normal that we are feeling unmotivated. It is normal that we are feeling exhausted and under pressure and, and under the cosh. And this will pass. This will pass. But, but give yourself a break sometimes. Really interesting question there about motivating after furlough, which I think is something that we're going to see more and more of um, and incredibly difficult for those people who've been working through because you may feel that you've not had a break and been managing perhaps more workload than um, normal because you've been the one in the office and then those individuals who are coming back perhaps having had a really lovely time but also perhaps feeling really quite down and um, and undervalued because their, their role hasn't hasn't been continuing so i think the difficult point with everyone coming back and starting to think about how we re-engage together now is that we've all been in very very different situations and so usually when somebody returns to work it's just that one individual returning into quite a static environment whereas now we're all returning coming together having been such you know through such different situations um, and so I think we need to come together as a team and think about, OK, well, how do we want to work differently moving forward? What was it about um, the time when we were on furlough that worked well and, and what did you appreciate and how can we maybe build some of those things into um, the new way of working, for example? But also, um, how do we maybe want to work differently to the way we were before? The management standards can be really great to think about a structured conversation. Sometimes if you say, how should we work differently? It can be really hard. Um, the management standards for work stress that um, the HSE um, drive forward, look at um, discrete areas of work and you can have a really open and interesting conversation around, okay, how do we talk about change? What would be helpful for you? What information? How do we connect? 
um, what information and 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 support do you need around work demands? How do we manage our demands as a team? How do we communicate with different parts of the business? And does that need to change now that we're working in a new way? 